Apologize for being maybe a little warmer in here than normal. Power just came back on like literally 30 minutes ago. So um, thought we were going to have to postpone service till a later time in the day. But we figured out what was wrong, and good old Tom Searles was able to, to get us back going again and he, between he and Russ. So we appreciate those guys doing that. Uh, today, Brother Zach Holmes is with us. Zach has uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago or so, took over the mission work that's being done in India that we support. And uh, he comes around every year or two to give us a, a, an update on everything that's happening over in India. So uh, we're going to give him an opportunity here today to share with us for the next 45 minutes uh, everything that's going on over in India. So I'm not going to take any more of his time. I'm going to give him every second he can. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. If not, uh, Zach will be here through our service. And uh, he will also be available to us for any questions after service if we need to. Zach, turn it over to you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Last time I was here, the outside was finished, but I don't think the inside was quite finished. And so this is my first time seeing the inside of the building. It's a very nice, well-lit place. I'm always a favor, in favor of well-lit because it helps me stay awake. It helps me see my Bible. And I've been in places where it is dark as a cave and the only windows are stained glass. And so it's, it's very difficult to worship and concentrate, but it is not this morning. Thankful so much for the opportunity to be here, to see you again, and to recognize faces. And I don't know names very well, but I do recognize many faces, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and to give you an update. India work, okay, we're above me. The India work has been going on for many years, longer than I've been alive. It was Brother J.C. Bailey, a Canadian preacher who went over many years ago because Americans could not get into India. He could, and so he went over and began the work in a small place in the state of Andhra Pradesh, and from there it blossomed, and it advanced to the work that it is today. And involved in this work, in this state we're working in, are about 1,200 preachers. That's a lot of preachers. About 400 of them are supported. Others, they preach in multiple places, and so they're supported in those congregations that they work with. But we're supporting about 400 <clears throat> or so because of the areas in which they work, are so poor that the congregation sometimes has nothing to give but a cup of rice. And so we oftentimes will support those preachers. We have two preaching schools, one designed for much like our preaching schools here, like the Memphis School of Preaching, in which a man will devote himself to two years of continuous study. And after that, he's given a certificate and he'll go out into the field and work. We have another school, it's designed for men who were denominational preachers. Denominational preachers are being converted in India like crazy. It's unbelievable that you can sit down and in one location they had 80 denominational preachers studying, and I'll talk more about that later and the impact that that has. But there's a school designed for those men who were denominational preachers. They were converted to the cause of Christ. They understand there is one true church and they want to serve in the kingdom of our Lord. And so they want to preach. It's not a good idea to take a man who last Sunday was in a Pentecostal church and send him this Sunday to go preach in the Lord's church. And so they educate that man. And so we have a school for that very reason, to educate those men. And so they'll study there two weeks each month for a whole year. We have 10 orphanages. 10. There are a lot of children in need over there. And with that, there are nine widows' homes. Usually if there's an orphanage, there's a widow's home. In one location, there's a boys' home and a girls' home, and so that's what makes 10. And there are many, many things that are going on, the orphans and the widows. The most important thing is that we ask for your prayers. Any mission work that you pray for, works that are done here in the States and overseas. And especially, we ask for your prayers for this work, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. Thank you for your support of this work. Thank you for being invested in doing mission work, not only in India, but in other locations, for the idea of mission work in this area. Because each time I've been here, there's been an emphasis in a banner or a sign or in a lesson on mission work. And we're all missionaries. We don't all go overseas, but we are all missionaries. We are to teach, we are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded, all the things we see the apostles have commanded, all those things we read in the New Testament. That's our job. 
And we don't have to go overseas. We don't have to have two years of formal training in a preaching school to be able to do that. Some of you sitting here today are a product of mission work done in this area. I'm certain of that because everywhere I go, there's someone who says, I didn't grow up in the church. Someone knocked on my door. Someone invited me to a gospel meeting. Somebody asked me for a Bible study. And I know there are some here this morning, you could say that also. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your financial support of this work. I'll be talking about some things, some needs that we have. And if you have any questions at all, as Scott said, afterwards, please, I'll be glad to talk with you until you get tired and are ready to go home and eat lunch. This is a mountain view as we passed over a large, remote mountain range. And we come to the other side, and we stop at this river right here, and that's probably the cleanest and purest view that I saw of India. There's no trash. There's no people down there to throw trash into the river. That's just part of their life. That's not because they're lazy. That's just part of their life. They don't have trash pickup like you and I do. They don't have recycle centers like you and I do. This looks like we might find this up in North Georgia or in Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains. So this is a beautiful scenery, and there are many beautiful places in India that look much like this. But there are many idols also. This is in the airport, and we arrive in Delhi. We fly into Delhi, and from there we fly further south. When you arrive in the airport, one of the first things you see, hand-carved idol. No doubt it took someone hours upon hours upon hours to carve this idol. And the stone idols that you will see, many of them as tall as the ceiling or taller, will be out in the middle of nowhere because they are an idol god to some crop or fertility or something related to that, a rain god. They have about a million gods in Hinduism. A million. And imagine the confusion when you have about a million gods. And with that many gods, sometimes they say, well, this idol's not serving, not doing anything for us anymore. And so they take that idol, and there's a place along the coast of India where they'll cast the idols into the sea, and the waves will hit. And if time allows, they will erode those stone idols away. Our God cannot be eroded away. Our God does not exist in a statue. He does not ex exist in a wood carving. Our God is a spirit. And he is not confined to those things. And so you see these in many places. They're everywhere. They have a rat god. They have a cow. They have a monkey that goes on. And they have a fertility god. And I can't describe to you the idol that we see in a place where we stay. You can walk right down to the river. And there's the fertility idol. And it is quite <laughs> obvious what it is representing. show you this receipt. You might not be able to tell. But this is from McDonald's in the Delhi airport. They have McDonald's there. When you go to the airport, it looks very much like our airports here. Most everything's in English, and people will speak in English. This is at McDonald's. You don't go and say, I want a number three, please. They don't have those like you and I do. So you must go order all your items separate. So I want a nine-piece nugget. Not a six, not a ten, a nine-piece nugget. If you don't want nuggets, then you can get the chicken sandwich. And if you don't want a chicken sandwich, you can get the spicy chicken sandwich. But in Hinduism, they don't eat beef. So KFC, very popular. McDonald's, very popular because they serve a lot of chicken. And so I got a nine-piece chicken nugget. You pay for the two sauces. You have to order the fries separate. You have to get the drink separate. It was 425 rupees and 26 cents. $425. That's $5.11 in American money. Go to McDonald's today and order a nine-piece nugget. They'll stare you in the face, but get two sauces, a fry, and a drink. I, you might be able to get it for less than 10 bucks. That just tells you about the price of food. Clothes, quite expensive in places. Food, not so expensive, so it varies, but that gives you a little bit about the culture in India. And then here is their electrical system. This is outside of the house where we stay in Tooney, and you look outside and you see this pole, and it's probably 12 feet high, and that's everybody's electrical line running to that pole. Because the man across the street wants electricity, they don't have a company that comes out and sets it up. He may tie in illegally without permission into the electrical line. And so you may be paying for your electricity and all your neighbor's electricity. In many cases, monkeys have died on this line, birds have died, and many husbands have died. 
But that's life in India. And I just want to share those with you. That's life in India. There's your electrical pole, and you see the confusion of that. It was about this time last year, there was severe flooding. It's the rainy season in the south of India. They have three seasons. They have hot, really hot, and hot. Now, they don't really have a winter. Their winter is 85 degrees and quite balmy. We were there in November. It was, it was really nice, actually. At night, we were in a short sleeve shirt and enjoying it, and they're shivering with, with coats on and blankets on. But this is the rainy season for them, and last year there was severe flooding, severe flooding. Greater than you and I can imagine, where one tributary river flooded two miles from its bank, another river further to the west, a mile, and at the point of where we had a children's home and a church building, it was about 12 feet deep. Severe flooding. And so we sent $76,000 over, and that's not very much. You, you couldn't rebuild your home for $76,000. Insurance will write you a check, but there, $76,000, you'd think it doesn't go very far. That helped rebuild or repair four church buildings. It helped provide clothes and furniture for an orphanage and for a preacher that lived there. And most of that money went towards food. Even if the floodwaters are about knee deep, and you say, well, I can walk in it, if you don't go to the market to sell, then people can't come and buy anything, and their life is pretty much daily. So when you wake up in that morning, you're going to go to the market, you're going to purchase something for your food that day. They might have some rice, but refrigeration is not always in the village because they don't have electricity in many places. And so you depend daily, go to the village, and to trade or to buy and to come back home and fix your meal for that day. If the floodwaters are high and you can't make it to the village or no one's coming to sell, then you have no food. So we were going in on boats and canoes and big trucks, whichever way possible to take in food and drink to those people in the village. And so that money went quite a ways. And so they're back in the rainy season again. And so far there are no major floods, but that could still happen. Sorry that you can't see the bottom, I'll tell you that that number. Our November campaign, we went last November for 12 days. You can see there were 207 baptisms. We opened 12 church buildings. That's an official opening. They're already in the building worshiping. And 11 of those 12 church building openings, of course we're preaching the gospel every time we open the building, but in 11 of those 12, people were converted to Christ. They stood and said, we want to be baptized for the remission of our sins. In the church building opening, you probably had an official opening for this building. You probably had, you know, a special day or something for this building when you came into it. They do that in India, too. And they preach the gospel and people were converted. We held three preacher lectureships, myself and one other uh, man. We conducted those lectureships, and there was one other, one of my elders at the congregation that supports this work. He went and opened church buildings while we were t conducting the preacher lectureship. What you can't see at the bottom, this happens from time to time with PowerPoint. They're lovely. They don't get their things straightened out. But last year alone, there were 1,709 baptisms in this work. 1,709 baptisms. That's a great number. Because 90% of those folks will remain faithful to the Lord. We've been conducting a study 20 plus years. 90% of the convert, converts will remain faithful to the Lord. Some will turn back to Hinduism because of family pressure. Because when they choose to become a Christian, young men, you lose your inheritance. Your father will no longer give you money at a certain time or give you the inheritance due to you as his son. And so you have no hope for the future. You're on your own. Now you're serving Jesus Christ. And what am I going to do? I don't have my father's blessing. My family has cut me off. Young women, in some cases... You choose to become Christians, your family will no longer find you a husband. That's life in India. Older women, sometimes their husbands kick them out of the home, and so they are left with nothing because they have not the same rights that we have here. And so they will come to live in the widow's homes. There is one such case of a widow who would go to worship on Sunday morning with the saints, and she would go back home to her Hindu husband, and he would beat her because she attended a Christian worship service. And the next Sunday, she woke up in the morning. She went to the assembly of the saints. She worshiped again. She went home. Her husband beat her. 
And after a few times they said, Sister, please just come live at the church building. And her decision was this. She said, I will not do such. Because how will he learn of my faithfulness if I leave him to come live here? She probably reread 1 Peter chapter 3. That sometimes without a word, the wife may win the husband. And so her devotion, her choice was, I'll go back home and I'll keep teaching him through my actions. I'll keep teaching him through not giving up. And so 90%, 90% includes those widows who are beaten. It includes those young men who have no inheritance. It includes those older women who are kicked out of their home and their family disowns them and they're left with nothing. I wish that we had the faithfulness here in the States that they have there. Our campaign for this year is set for October 30th. That's a Monday. We'll attempt to leave Nashville. <laughs> Nashville airport's been backed up, probably just like Atlanta airports have been, but Nashville airports have been backed up for quite some time, and many flights delayed or canceled. So we hope that we will leave on Monday, October 30th, and that we'll be in India for about three weeks. We'll come back home on Friday, November the 17th. We ask for your prayers. In this effort, there are six of us that are going. This is the largest group we've had since pre-COVID. And there's been some government changes, and so we've been two different times since then without issue. We hope that it will be this, the same this time. I, I don't believe we'll have any issues, but we sure would appreciate your prayers that we may enter into the country. Once you get in there, you're okay. It's getting past customs. They see, here's a group of Americans coming, but... The good thing is, on our flight, there are many Swedes who are coming, many who are from Denmark or Norway, they're coming for work, and so we just look like regular businessmen, except we're not there for business. And so many times they don't question because there's so many Europeans or Americans coming through, but we ask for your prayers in that. The state at the bottom in red is the state of Andhra Pradesh. There are 98 million people, 98 million people that live in that state. Most of the state, though, is not populated. It is very rural in some areas. In some of your lifetimes, I'm 42, so a little bit before I was born, in some of the villages, tigers would still come in at night and take people from their huts in their sleep. And so they've driven most of the tigers away. There are bears there, and there are cheetahs in the air, but it's quite scarce to see them now because they've ran them all off. But most of the area is very remote. 98 million people live in a country that if I dropped you down there, you'd say, there's no one around, where am I gonna go? Amber alert. <laughs> <laughs> or silver alert. So it's a very remote area. Many places along the coast, a city, let's just say Covington, because that's the closest one. We've all been to Covington. You may have millions upon millions upon millions of people living in a smaller area like that. Imagine the size of Atlanta. Delhi's a huge place. I can't even tell you how many millions of people live in Delhi. So what happens is you have very large concentrations of people living in certain areas, and the rest of the land is very remote. It's farmland, government-owned, and so we'll be driving in the middle of nowhere. You haven't seen anybody or anything for quite some time, and there'll be orchards or there'll be rice fields. And so it is a very, very unique land. There are many congregations in these populated areas, but the success that we find, the success that Jesus found, was to go out into the highways and the byways, go out to the areas outside of the city where those people are receptive to the gospel. And so many of the places we go, they're not educated formally, they don't know how to read. You'll go to many places and you'll go visit a congregation and no one will have Bibles. Well, let's get these folks some Bibles, it won't matter, they cannot read. And they'll spend their life never learning to read. And so it's quite interesting when an Indian brother is teaching in a village, and he's teaching, and he's reading from Scripture, and he's teaching, and he's teaching, and maybe another Indian brother from far off comes, and he preaches the same thing, and he's reading and teaching, and they're, wait a minute, this guy's saying the same thing. And then when someone comes from another country, and he's saying the same thing, that's why we would have over 200 baptisms in November. Not because we were there, but because the work has already been done. And so they're going into these very remote places, sending preachers into locations. And one such location, we fly into Vizac, but that mountain range that's on the far left over there, you see it's very green. There's one yellow road crossing over that, and that road is not 
it is not a formal road. It's not paved, it's not graveled, very remote area. And we've crossed over that way heading further west, and we stopped in the middle of nowhere, absolute nowhere. And John says, brother, see that path? Dirt, is that dirt right there going into the trees? He said, yes, brother. That is the only path into a village 10 kilometers into the mountains. That's about six miles. That's the only pathway in, which means no vehicles, no formal buildings with building materials. They would use what resources they have there in the forest. No electricity, no cell phones, no computers. In that area, there are some tribes that still offer human sacrifices. And so you live six miles off the beaten path, on an even more beaten, <laughs> less beaten path, and you wake up on the Lord's Day, and you and four other people, there are only five Christians in that village, and you and four other people are going to assemble together and worship the one true living God. And everyone else in your village, whatever tribe, whatever God, whomever they serve, you stand out like a sore thumb. And in some places, it's like a slap in the face to the village because you turn against your tribe, against the family because you're now no longer serving in what religion they're serving in. And your parents before you did that and their parents before them did that. Well, our family's always done it, so that's just the way I'm going to do it. Too many times that's what we hear people say here. They will not break that family mold. Please don't be a Christian because your parents were a Christian. Please don't be a Christian because their parents were a Christian. Be a Christian because you look to the Scripture and you see for yourself, this is what God wants me to be. Don't ever serve because your parents did. We passed through all those areas. Very much work done in Tooney, which is the second blue point there. That's where one of the preaching schools are. And that other blue point in the bottom of the check mark thing there, that is a second location of a school. It's so small the name doesn't even show up on the map. We have that location in a school there. And then in Rampashat of Arm, or we call it Rampa. In our newsletter, it's called the Rampashat of Arm and Tooney Mission Work because those are the two main cities. But the work extends very far away, actually into three different states where they speak multiple languages. And they have recently began work with World Video Bible School in translating all the World Video Bible School's lessons into the language of Telugu. It's quite surprising that someone might not have electricity, but they'll have a cell phone. <laughs> because the Indian government's made it possible for people to have cell phones. Church buildings are very important. I'll tell you about this building very quickly. This is about two miles from the river that flooded. The waters came almost to this point, and they used this location as a flood relief location. We sent the money last September for it to be built, so that's right after flood time. So this location was used to provide flood aid. We sent the money in September. We were there in November. The building was opened. It's in the middle of nowhere. The closest village, the closest sign of life is a mile back to the west. The river is about two miles back to the west, and the floodwaters almost came to this location. We were there that day to open the building. There were 25 in attendance. I could actually count how many people were there. There were 25 in attendance. My elder was with me. He was preaching, and I sat there, and I counted 25. And when the Lord's invitation was extended, seven, seven people stood and said, we want to become Christians. 25 people, and seven of them were not Christians. What if that building didn't exist there? What if Christians didn't meet in that location? It's just a building. What if they didn't meet there? What if they hadn't invited people? Remember, this is a, at least a mile away from any sign of civilization. Out here in farmland, that hut that you see right there is where the preacher lives because he lost his home in the flood, and so he said, I don't want to leave. I want to continue working, and so he lives in that hut. It's about the size of this stage here. They are going to build him a home a little bit over to the left there, and we hope to see that when we go in the future. Buildings are very, very important. This is another location I was at on a Sunday morning. There are about 230, 250 people in that picture. It's hard to count because some of them are back there in the shade. There are a lot of folks there. And that Lord's Day we assembled, and this is just the inside. This is the auditorium. You say, why don't they build a bigger auditorium? Well, they did what they could with the money they had and the land that they had. So you've got folks sitting out back. Many of the elderly people will sit out back in chairs. Women and children sitting there on the ground. And then 
outside this way, there are many men and young boys and some women that are sitting out there. And we worshiped the Lord. We sang songs. We prayed. We partook of the Lord's Supper. We gave of our means. And then we opened up God's Word. You see the building that's decorated? We would think here, oh, they're having a VBS this week. <laughs> that's just the way they decorate. They take pride in their buildings. And you'll see there that lady, she's putting her offering in the offering box. They don't pass a tray around like we do. They have a box at the front, and everyone will stand at one time, and they will begin singing a song, and they will start from the front, and everyone will walk and put something in that box. Because many people don't have anything. And so they don't want people to feel compelled. And that's what they called it. Brother, we, want, we don't want to be compulsory. It should be a cheerful offering and one that comes from the heart. And so they do things a little bit different than we do. Here's the flood-affected area. This is the children's home and the church building, and that is about a mile west of another river in which we passed over. At that point, you can see the children's home. It's the Jesus Loves the Children, or it's the Jesus Loves the Little Children, Home for Children. It's a long, it's a long name. But you see the waters there? They're about 12 feet deep at that point. The preacher lives in the bottom floor, the saints assemble on the second floor, what we call the church building, and that's one of the areas that was affected severely by the floods. This picture was taken as the preacher was finally evacuated from that area. He was the last one to leave. All the children had been evacuated safely, and he leaves looking at his home there on the bottom floor in which he lost everything. You could enter in, still see the silt marks on the wall, even in November when we were there and everything was dried up. And then this picture I took the day that we arrived. The children have thrown flowers on the ground, welcoming us there. And then we stood outside with them. I'm six foot four. The top of that window, I'm going to guess, is seven foot or close to it. And so you see just how high up it is. They've repainted it, but the floodwaters were very deep there. It is very likely that some of those children are there because they lost their parents in the flood. An orphan in India is one who may have lost one parent or both parents. Or it may be that a parent cannot take care of that child. And so they just lump all children in and call them orphan, even if they don't all meet the same qualifications. But you see those children standing there. The oldest and the tallest was 14 years old. And I went and sat down next to him, and that time my oldest son was 14 years old. And I sat next to that boy and said, this is my son here. Because of that children's home there, there's a place for children to come and to live. The Indian government has no formal system. They don't take care of children in such a way. So they actually approve of the work of the church. In many villages, the village president or the governor, or whatever you call him, he has given approval and sanctioned for us to continue the work because we're taking care of them. And so what about this boy right here and many others? 95% of the children in the orphan's home will be converted to Christ. They will become Christians. They will marry Christians. They will be educated if they choose to do so because we have several colleges in which they can attend. And then from there they will go preach or they will go work in the location. And many of them, the government dictates where you work sometimes. And so they may send them over somewhere where there's not a congregation. They will begin teaching and preaching and they will meet in their home, much like the first century. Or orphans. You see the children here, for you young people, teenagers, maybe you're homeschooled or public schooled, I will tell you, those children are doing their homework unsupervised. They don't have adult supervision because they don't need it. They don't have cell phones, so that helps. But they're not falling asleep. That's 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night. They're not falling asleep. They're not hitting each other and giggling and laughing. They're actually studying three languages, Hindi, which is the high caste language, Telugu, that's their native language, and English. And they're studying math and science. And they're doing their homework. The boys, just the same, are doing their homework unsupervised. They don't need supervision. In that one particular home in Rampa, there were 122 children when we were there in November. There are 257 children there now. COVID has caused many children to become orphans. AIDS has caused many children to become orphans. And other diseases, malaria and other things have happened to their parents. And so all those children were begging for a place to go. And they kept saying, we cannot take anymore. We cannot, school will not allow them to change in the middle of the school year. We have that freedom here. They can't do that there. And so once the school year was over, they said, okay, 
we'll take some more children on. So they went from 122 to 257 children. That's a lot of children, but 95% of those children will become Christians. Some enter when they're older, and they've been plagued by Hinduism, and so their hearts will not be touched by the gospel. They will leave after just a couple of years, and so they, they will never become Christians. Because of the vast number of children there, many of them are having to sleep on the ground. They have to hire someone to watch the children at night because of the snakes and the monkeys. The monkeys are more dangerous than the snakes. <laughs> they've, had to, they've killed several snakes in that location. No, no children have been harmed by the snakes, but they'll kill the snake and get rid of it. And the monkeys. The monkeys will come down at night and try to eat the fruit or the flowers on the plants or try to find some scrap of food somewhere, and so they have to hire someone. And you see those young men sleeping on the floor, and you say, what horrible conditions. That's better than what they came from. You could offer them a bed and a nice mattress. They will not sleep on it because that's not life for them. They don't have mattresses. So they will be just as happy sleeping on the ground next to their buddy as they would sleeping on a mattress bed. But they need cots. You can see there's a need. Now there's 257 children. So there's a need for cots and mattresses. A mattress for them is just a small pad to go on top of the cot. There's a property next door. We were there in November. We looked at that property. Just to this side is the compound where they currently live. That alleyway in the building in the back owned by members of the church. There are negotiations to purchase that. But we were able to purchase that dilapidated house. And so just last week, they finally, we sent the funds, we had purchased the land, but we sent the funds for them to tear it down. And so they began tearing it down. This is the lot out back, and they were able to clear it all out and start taking measurements. We sent $30,000 last week so that they could begin laying the foundation for a boy's home. They need it. We're still $90,000 short for the building of the building. And they also have to expand the kitchen, and they also have other things that they need to do. But the good news is, we've sent funds, and so they'll begin with the foundation, and they can build the building in phases, and so they will do so very quickly. Another issue, for us it's an issue, for them it's not a big deal, but they wash their clothes by hand. Children as young as five years old, because they don't allow infants to come stay, they couldn't take care of them, but usually about four or five years old, and so those children are washing their clothes daily, if not daily, every other day. So there's 257 children there, and there's about 40 widows that live in that one home there. And they're washing their clothes by hand every day, or every other day at least. And that's where they do it. Out back's a slab. The animals are staying over there. They have animals, have chickens, turkey, emu. So they have animals over there, and this is the area. And with a hand pump, they will pump out water into a bucket, and they have their soap and they will begin washing their clothes, and then they have to find a place to hang them to dry. 257 children plus about 40 widows. That's about 300 people to wash their clothes by hand and to find a place to hang them up. And so we said, how can we help? And for the first time, for the first time in many of the adults' lives there, and especially for the children, we were able to purchase, the congregation gave money to purchase three washers and dryers for that location. So those children don't have to go out and wash their clothes by hand. Those widows don't have to go out and wash their clothes by hand. And so we were able to do that, provide the washers and dryers. That's not life for them. That's not what they're accustomed to. You and I will go home, we'll throw it in a washer and dryer. We may have an app and it'll tell us when it's done. My wife does. It'll ding and tell her when it's done and she can go downstairs and take care of it. They don't have those things. So we don't think about life like that. Some of you may have lived in a time where you washed your clothes by hand, but that's not a custom of what we're doing here. So here are our current needs for the orphans there. We still need 90000 to continue building the home. I received a text message this morning from a congregation that supports work, and they said, hey, we've gathered this amount of money. We're going to send it. You choose to do what you want with it. And so we'll send another portion of that money before long. So that'll help cut down on that 90,000 cots and mattresses. There are 150 of those needed. We actually bought four just this past week. And so now we need 146 cots and mattresses. They need to expand the kitchen and dining area. They used to cook outdoors. Then they enclosed that a few years ago. The kitchen's probably about the space of this area here. And so they'll need to expand that. They're having to feed in shifts. 
And so 257 children usually will feed, and then you'll have the next shift, and then you'll have the next shift, and you have the next shift, and so they need to expand the kitchen and dining area, and then transportation. It is the rainy season. The church building from that location is four miles. And so they're accustomed to walking. They'll walk to school and back home, they'll walk to school back home, they'll walk to the church building, but in the rainy season, when there's a monsoon, you have 257 children and about 40 widows, you've got to get them to the church building. And that bus will take probably 30, the one they have now will take 30. Can you imagine that trip? Over to the church building and back, get another, over to the church building and back, another, another. So they, their need for another bus to transport because of the vast number of children. Please pray for this. And if you are interested in learning more about this, please talk to me afterwards. Our widows, I've mentioned widows several times already. Many of them are kicked out of their home. They're called widows in India, even if their husband is still living, but many of them, their husband has died. Their culture is, even if you're 25 and you're married and your husband dies, they will not remarry. They have been taught from the scripture that once their husband dies or he is unfaithful to them, they're allowed to remarry. We're given that privilege to do so, but they choose not to because their culture says once your husband dies, you will not remarry. And so there are many, many widows that don't live in the home that are supported. See that lady there on the right? She is 90 years old. We were there for two-day lectureship. So all the church members are going early in the morning and they're going and preparing food. They're cooking out over an open fire. And so they're going early in the morning to prepare food for lunch. They'll come home and rest. They'll go back in the evening to prepare food for the evening meal, and then they will be there till late hours washing the pots and pans and preparing for the next day. She is 90 years old. And for those two days, she got up in the morning with all the other widows, and she walked four miles to the church building. She came home to rest. She walked back four miles in the evening to go prepare more food, and she stayed till the late hours and then came back home for two days. So that's four, eight 12, 16 in one day, and the same the next day. And they said, Sister, we will take you. And she says, No, I will walk. So that's quite bold of her to, to say at 90 that she's going to walk all that way. But what's more important than that is she says, I will not miss the assembling of God's people together for the purpose of lectureship, preacher lectureship, or for serving food. She's an encouragement to me, and I hope she is to you that will be as invested in serving as she is. The last section here about the lectureships. They always prepare a sign, and it will humble you greatly. When you go into a village, you'll see those people maybe once in your lifetime, but they have prepared a sign with your picture on it and your name, and you come up into the village, and you see they have that for you, and it will bring you to tears because you say, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. And so they prepare many signs. This one for the lectureship, and that's not one they can reuse. It says 2022, so we can't reuse that one again. But they had that sign and another sign with our names on it, but they welcome us to the lectureship in Tooney. There is John Ratnam standing to my right. There's John Anon. He is the instructor of the school there, and he is an instructor in four other locations. So they have remote schools underneath a palm tree somewhere, underneath a tent in another place, but he is a very busy man. To my left is Brother Jimmy G. He went also, we conducted the preacher lectureships, and then to his left is Brother Solomon. He is the preacher at this location, and he lives here at this church building. So the premise is, for two days we're conducting lessons. They centered around the authority of the Bible, the authority of God, Jesus, the apostles, and some other subjects. And so after each lesson, they will extend the Lord's invitation. And after that, it's open mic. So starting next Sunday, when Tate gets finished preaching, and the symbol is, is, is conducted, worship is conducted, then it's open mic. And so he's going to hand the microphone. You ask him whatever in the world you want to. That's what we do there. And I know he'd be ready to do that. They'll ask such questions as, why does Jesus say in, in Mark 16, 16, believe and be baptized? But Peter says in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. They'll ask genuine questions like that. They said, is there a contradiction? And we say, no. Jesus is speaking about people who don't believe already. And Peter is talking to people who know they killed the Christ. And they're pricked in their heart, and they said, what shall we do? There's no need to tell them to believe. And then they will shake their head, yes, very well. And they will understand. And so sometimes they'll ask questions about Revelation. And that one is really tough. Premillennialism, 
uh, denominational doctrines, they ask many of those questions, but they're given those opportunities, and not all of those who ask questions are Christians. And so there's six, seven, eight hundred people, and they're asking such questions. This is at another location. This is inside the, the church building. But out back, there are women and children and other men out there. And then over to this side of the building, there's even more folks. There are folks everywhere. And they are upstairs in the school building studying up there also. There are people everywhere. And we have big microphones and big PA systems because across the street, there's a denominational building and they're blasting their denominational music. And do you know when they turn the volume up on the lesson about the one true church? I'm not kidding you. We're teaching about the one true church. Nobody's even over there assembling, but as soon as we start talking about the one true church, they turn it up. Blah, 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 and it's over there, it's loud as can be, and they're trying to drown us out. This school is a school designed for men who were denominational preachers. One man from this school attended here. One man. He went five hours to the south where there was a need for a preacher. He began studying, and he invited denominational preachers to come. And last August, there was a meeting of 80 denominational preachers. That is unheard of here unless it's like Southern Baptist Convention, something that you're not going to get 80 denominational preachers together to study the Bible. And so this preacher invited John, who is standing there, and he said, come down, brother, study with me. Let's, let's study with them. And so John goes down for two days. They study with those men. That was last August. As of November, half of those preachers have been converted to Christ. That's the biggest gain is to take the denominational preacher who's only ever heard. When you show him the scripture, he says, oh, this is what I must do. And so he will be obedient to the gospel. And then he'll go back to where he was. He'll preach to them, and many times he'll convert many of them also. And that's how the church is spreading like wildfire amidst persecution. And one man from that school. This is in Rampa, very large church building. There is a hospital here, a dentist office, an engineering school, and a high school. Many things conducted at this location. This is one of the high school classrooms out back. We're teaching the same lessons at this location, and after one lesson, just one lesson, 14 men said we want to become Christians at a preacher lectureship. And I'll show you this. This is the last slide, and I'm going to be perfectly on time. Their custom is not like our custom. I'm certain here this morning when Tate concludes and he extends the Lord's invitation that there's probably going to be an invitation song. That's our custom in the United States. You realize that's not the custom of the church outside the United States. There's nothing wrong with the invitation song. We're to sing, we're to admonish and edify one another and sing praises to God. We do that as an encouragement for someone to come and to a Christian to say, please pray for me, I'm standing in my life, give me strength. Or for someone who's not a Christian to come and to say, I want to become a Christian. But that's not their custom. So after a lesson's been taught, then we will extend the invitation. And many times our Indian brothers who are translating for us, they will continue because they know the people. And they will say things as such. They will say, you know that we've been studying the Bible, ma'am. And you know that you need to become a Christian. Why are you waiting? You need to do so quickly before the Lord comes back. They will say things like that. Two people. They may say to another man, brother, you know you were in sin. You know you must repent of alcohol. You have been drinking. You're a Christian. You know better. And they will say things like that. In one such location, we were there, and all the teenage girls were sitting up front and had their Bibles, and John said to one of them, you know that just having that Bible will not save you. You must obey it. And she bows her head, and she's shy. And a lady from the back stands up and starts to come to the front, and I said, oh, no. <laughs> but it's not the United States. Mama wasn't coming to get on to John. Mama was coming to tell a daughter, he's right. You know what to do. And she stood and said, I want to become a Christian. So they don't have an invitation song. They say, anyone to become a Christian, stand. Well, your son needs to become a Christian. Yes, go, go. You're a preacher. You've been studying with someone. Stand. You know, you know what you must do. Let's go, let's go. And so they will encourage people, and you'll see someone stand here, and, someone, and they'll all come to the front, and you'll see there are, Many people there, men, and there's a woman there, two women actually. What's unique though is that that man that's pictured there, and I show him on the right, he and John are in a conversation. And John looks to me and says, Brother, this is one of our preachers. Remember, it's not their custom, the invitation for Christians to come and ask for prayers. They do that in a different way. That's our custom. 
So the invitation there is, the custom is, if you're not a Christian, you will come and I want to be baptized for the remission of sins. So he comes and John says, that's one of our preachers. And the man proceeds to say, I have lied. That's great, brother. I'm glad you're, you're confessing your sin. We'll pray with no. He says, no, no, no. He says, I'm not a Christian at all. Three years. Three years he has been preaching and teaching. And he told them he was a Christian. You told me this morning you're a Christian. You don't have to show me your identification card. We don't have to get two or three witnesses who are there at your baptism. If you say you're a Christian, I'm going to believe you're a Christian. He says, I'm a Christian. He's teaching and he's preaching. Great. Not their fault. And that day he said, I have lied. He repented of his sins. He confessed Jesus Christ as his Savior. And we saw him and those others go out the doors and go out to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That's happening in India. And I hope that encourages you. hope that ignites something in you to say, we can do the same here. We can do the same in this area with our family members and friends. And we can set up Bible studies and we can serve the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God of heaven, we know that you're a God that is kind and loving and long-suffering. We're thankful for your patience and your endurance of our ignorance at times, Father, and our lack of doing thy will. We're so thankful that you're patient and kind to souls all throughout the whole world, that you have blessed the work in India as you blessed the work in many countries, Father. Many people are seeking to find those who are lost, even here in this community. And we pray, Father, you continue to bless our efforts. Please be long-suffering so that we may reach others with the gospel. We're thankful so much for the work in India, and we pray for your continued blessings. We're thankful for this congregation that meets here and thy children that are serving thee here, and we pray your greatest blessings upon them. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray these things, and amen. If you have any questions, please find me afterwards. I'll be glad to talk to you.